if you are interested in living freely and fully, one of the most important things you can do in life is learn how to think like an artist. This is the revolution of one will be live stream with TK and Kamau. And we're going to talk about how to steal like an artist today. What's up, brother Kamau? What up, what up, what up? Yeah, this is going to be a good one. Uh, I think a lot of people in the audience are natural creators, uh, natural innovators, natural entrepreneurs. And this is talking about uh, essentially a philosophy that combines all three of them together and gives you just a well-rounded approach uh, to approaching creative work. Absolutely, man. And for the people in my audience, because they always there, and I got to explain this to y'all every single time, for the people that are wondering, what does this have to do with freedom? Let me answer that easy question once more, and I'll do it for you every day and as many times as you need me to, because it's got a heck of a lot more to do with your freedom than anything that any politician promises you. Creativity is the essence of life. It's not the consolation prize. It's not the bronze medal. It's not some mystical power that you invoke when you are a loser who can't achieve real success. Creativity is the basis for all success. It is the foundation for all freedom. And it is the purpose for why freedom matters in the first place. As human beings, we are creative to our core. That is what it means to be human through and through. And one of the biggest problems in this world is that so many people have adopted a stereotypical conception of what it means to be creative, that they have defined themselves out of the game. We are all meant to live creatively, whether you have an eccentric personality or not, whether you define yourself as a visual artist or not, whether you've ever taken a theater improvisation class or not, to be human is to be creative and there are so many valuable lessons that we need to learn from artists because life itself is meant to be the highest form of art. So that's why we're talking about art today, because we're interested in freedom and we're not going to sit here and pretend like the fastest and most efficient way to get to freedom is by waiting for politicians to do things for us. We want to know how we can bring a sense of artistry and autonomy to every area of life. That's why the artists have a lot to say, man. I tell you, um, I, I've, I've actually joked around before about starting something called the Reverse Reagan Foundation because, you know, Ronald Reagan was an actor and he left the theater behind to go into politics. And I would love mm. to, to do the reverse. I would love to convince more people to, instead of going into politics, go into art, go do something and earn an honest living and get out there and change the world, man, by shaping people's minds and capturing their imaginations for good. Go do some theater, go make some music, go get involved in fashion. Go start a business. You want to change the world. Don't limit yourself I, I, to politics, people. I, I don't I don't know how forgiven the audience would be from some of the politicians' past history. I, I don't I don't know if if a good monologue is gonna uh, reverse that and and gonna get the audience on their side. Yeah, well, you know what? Everybody agrees with this. You just need the right politician in office in order for them to see it. Everybody knows that real power comes from creativity and that we shouldn't be placing our faith in politicians. It's just hard to convince people of that when they're under the illusion that they're winning politically. But that's why you gotta talk to the losers. That's why you gotta always talk to the people that think they're losing politically because they're ready to question things, man. They're ready to create alternatives. And for all the folks out there that's thinking y'all winning, uh, I'll see you in four years or maybe eight years, but I'll see you soon. I'll see you soon. You'll, you'll, be, you'll be ready to question politicians again. You'll be ready to hear a message about placing faith in, in the power of the individual again. And I'll welcome you back with open arms. I won't say I told you so. I'll just say, hey, man, let's not waste time talking about anything other than your own personal power. <laughs> I don't know if I believe you. You're, you're the I told you so kind of person. <laughs> no, I promise, man. Not, man. All right. So the title of this, because I'm, I'm over here talking about think like an artist, but you can see that the episode is titled Steal Like an Artist, which is actually an extension of what it means to think like an artist. And it's inspired by a book uh, by Austin Kleon of the same title. And I wrote a Medium post some time ago called Five Ways to Steal Like an Artist. And I basically made five points. I mean, he makes several in the book, but I distilled five lessons from the book and in and, and corresponding each lesson, I, I, I pointed out uh, there's a passage that we'll read too. So what we'll do is we'll go slide by slide and we're going to we're going to identify the lesson, which is like a single sentence or two. Then Kamal is going to read the passage that inspired that lesson. And we'll just riff a little bit on this idea of stealing like an artist. 
You ready to roll, brother? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it, man. Lesson number one. If it's powerful enough to distract you, don't ignore it. Harness its power. One thing I've learned in my brief career, it's the side projects that really take off. By side projects, I mean the stuff that you thought was just messing around. Stuff that's just play. That's actually the good stuff. That's where the magic happens. So what did what did you mean by that? Or what, what did you yeah. mean by your... Your, your, your one liner and, and, and how that uh, contextualized the passage I just read. Yeah, man, play and recreation is a forgotten and un- underestimated sort, uh, source of magic. Let me say that again. Play and recreation is a forgotten and underestimated source of magic. When you think about how many of us are raised in school we're taught that learning involves doing all of the things that we are told by authority figures to do first. Now, if you have interest, hopefully at some point in the day when you're done with all your classes and you finished all your homework and you've handled all your chores at home, you might be able to have some time left over before bedtime to fool around with your interest. But those things aren't a priority. We don't put those things first. Those are luxuries that that are a reward for handling your responsibilities. And so as we grow up into adulthood, we tend to adopt that same approach. We tend to treat our interest as luxuries that are the reward for being responsible, but all the power in life, the power to make a living, the power to be respected, that comes from handling our responsibilities first. And what gets left out of the equation is that you also have a responsibility to cultivate your unique gifts and talents. And the only way to do that is to start by exploring your curiosities and paying close attention to what interests you because your ultimate competitive advantage does not lie in the arena of your ability to do what other people tell you to do. It lies in the domain of things that fascinate you, things that intrigue you, even when your other friends are bored by them or when they make fun of you for it. All of that weird stuff that's unique to you That's where your real competitive advantage is. And so you have to create space for play if you really want to discover who you are and what you're best at. And I feel that a lot of people don't give themselves permission to indulge in certain activities Mm -hmm. unless they can Mm -hmm. prove beforehand that it's going to lead to a career improvement or an increase in income. And I think that's a really self-defeating approach uh, to take and it blinds you from seeing your full range of possibilities. Definitely. I, I think most people view it that way is probably because that's how school was. That's how uh, the institutions mm-hmm. that you go through as a, as a child, that they were the ones who wouldn't give you permission to pursue those things because it wasn't directly uh, related to the curriculum or it wasn't related to. Hey, brother, come out, you get- brother, come out. It, it, it cut you, out. Yeah. 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 You, you sound like you're saying you. some good stuff. So if you could start that over. I got yeah. you. I want sure. everybody to hear. Well, I, I was just saying, I think that's so much of the case because the institutions um, that we, we came up in as kids, whether that was school, whether that was some other uh, learning environment that was, you know, pretty rigid in terms of uh, their approach they're the ones who probably didn't give you permission at an early age to, to, to pursue those things that interest you. They, they're the ones who said, if it's not directly related to the curriculum, if it's not related to the standardized test that you need, if it's not related to any of the things that we need to t- fulfill, um, then we're going to give, we're not going to put the emphasis on that. We're not, we're not going to, uh, give importance. We're not, uh, even going to give you permission to an extent. And so I think so much of the creative process, so much of the, uh, the entrepreneurial process is having to unlearn, uh, all the rigid and, 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 you know, oppressive structure that's put on your creativity. You have to be able to walk back, uh, that very confined mindset and be comfortable leaning into the things, uh, that you want to lean into. I know it sounds so foreign, like doing the stuff that I want to do, doing the stuff that has an interest, even if it doesn't necessarily translate to bringing more dollars in the door. 
um, or if it doesn't translate to, to get in good grades, uh, I, I think there's still a place in your life for this. You know, it's funny. I actually uh, reposted a post on Instagram uh, last night and it essentially said, you know, why are you wasting your time arguing arguing with other humans about something God told you to do? This mm. this thing that that makes you come alive, you know, the reason you don't need permission is because it came from something greater than the people who could give you permission anyway. You know, this thing that yeah. that you're called to do is you're called to do it for a reason. You're called to do it because uh, it, it comes naturally to you because it you know you're blessed with the ability to do this and to do it um, at a good level, to do things that are easy for you and and that you enjoy doing. You should do more of those things. And I think, you know, to give yourself permission, I think it's probably important to understand that, you know, you didn't come into this mindset where you needed permission. You were told that you can't have permission to do this kind of thing. So now that you know, you know, where the source of maybe your anxiety comes from when you start to to pursue the things that you enjoy, um, I think you can give yourself permission. You can go through that process of un unlearning the oppressive structure and and really feel free to explore those creative endeavors. Man, I got, I got a personal testimony on this one. I know for me, and I've, I've talked with you about this before, I love to read. I don't read because I think it's important or because I think other people will respect me for it. I read and pick up a book for the same reason that some people pick up a basketball. I enjoy it. I do it for the love of the game. But for a long stretch of time, man, as life began to get busy and I took on a lot of responsibilities, I stopped reading and weeks would go by. Sometimes months would go by where I, I wouldn't do any reading. And the less I read, the less time it seemed like I had to read. And the reason was because I felt like, hey, it would be irresponsible for me to just take a couple of hours and read when I have all of these other things I need to do, all of these people depending on me. And I looked at all of those responsibilities as the real source of my value. And I got to take care of those things first before I give myself permission to do reading, because that's not the real source of my value. That's just the source of my joy. What I was forgetting is that it's the other way around. Once I began to get up early enough to make time to put reading first, it not only gave me joy, but it allowed me to bring a sense of nourishment and enthusiasm to the work itself and the work begins to improve. And so a lot of the things that we put off because we don't see those things as practical enough, those are actually the things that make us more interesting and they allow us to bring a greater sense of interestingness to the work that we're trying so hard to get better at. So here are two different questions you can ask for the audience if you're looking for a pragmatic approach. The first question you can ask is, do I need to do this? Let's see what that looks like. You have a responsibility like taking out the garbage. Do I need to do this? The answer to that is obviously yes. But then you have something else like playing the piano. Do I need to play the piano today? The answer to that is obviously no. So if you go around only asking that question, what do I need to do? You're only going to do things that are urgent and you're never going to do those fun, playful things because they're really not necessary. But what if we change that question? What if we change that question to, does this make me a more interesting version of myself? Now let's apply that to taking out the garbage. No, it doesn't. I need to do it, but it doesn't make me a more interesting person. And I'm never gonna make history at that, by the way. Does playing the piano today make me a more interesting version of myself? The answer to that is definitely yes. And, and, and you feel the difference in energy when you ask that kind of question. So don't limit yourself to only asking is this necessary also ask does this make me more interesting because you get two different answers when you ask those two different questions and you need to think about them both definitely last thing i wanted to say on this is when you're playing i think your your brain works differently i'm not a scientist not a biologist not going to go into the neuroscience and, so and the things that are firing. Well, wait a minute, Kamal. <laughs> Either way it goes, there there is a different chemical reaction happening, um, and and those endorphins are flowing. This is a good thing, you know. You're you're experiencing joy, and I think 
you're operating at, at another level. And, and, and a lot of times I think, you know, when we're trying to solve a problem or we're, when we're trying to work through something, um, you know, we might feel stressed by time. We might just be running up against a creative wall and we're not understanding what is going on here. Like, why, why can I tap into my creativity? Why can I, you know, get on top of my game? And sometimes the best thing to do uh, is to walk away, set it down for a second and go work on something else and then come back to that thing. And I think this ties into the concept how, you know, a lot of people find that some of their best ideas come in the shower or on a walk or, you know, doing something that they enjoy doing that, 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 that's where the magic comes from. It's, it's from playing. It's from, it's from doing something that you enjoy, uh, something that you're, you're not forcing yourself to figure out. But having space for that, I think, uh, helps other things that you're trying to figure out. Ideas, ideas will come um, if if you're not so stressed about it. If if you're if you can get in a space of flow, if you, if you can get in a space of enjoyment, um, if that's for you playing the piano, whatever that is, I I, I wouldn't think about that activity as uh, removed from the other important aspects of your life. But it, it's just another vehicle uh, to help get your mind moving and, and your ideas generating and and just to be more comfortable being in a creative space. You know, depending on the kind of work you do, you, you might not get a lot of time to be able to be in a creative space. But the more that you can do fun, playful activities that put you in that position anyway, that that same energy, you know, all of that, uh, those thought processes, those ideas, they're going to start to transfer and improve these other aspects where you do want to bring that level of creativity to. Word to the wise. I'm going to recommend a few books. I like to recommend books for anybody that's interested in just kind of following up on these types of ideas. And so when, when they come to mind, I'll throw them out there. So one is by Peter Gray, and it's called Freedom to Learn. And this is a book about the value of play within the context of education itself. So if you are in homeschooling, unschooling, or you are a teacher, uh, educator of any kind, you're a student, check out Peter Gray's Freedom to Learn, uh, Free to Learn, and uh, you'll get some good ideas about the, the, the intellectual and scholarly value that play brings to the education space. The second is Robert Fritz, Life as Art, and it's a very excellent book that talks about bringing a sense of artistry to all that you do and approaching your life as if it's the canvas and you are the artist. And, and there's a lot of substance in his writings. It's not just like a bunch of fluffy poetry that says your life is art. The third is a book by James P. Kars, and it's called Finite and Infinite Games. It's subtitled A Vision of Life as Play and Possibility. And it's kind of more like a meta level philosophical book but it's very interesting and will give you some cool ways of thinking about this idea of life as a game and exercising control over the way that you play that game. We can go to lesson number two. Even if you marry a single interest, don't stop flirting with other passions. If you have two or three real passions, don't feel like you have to pick and choose between them. Don't discard. Keep all of your passions in your life. The thing is, you can cut off a couple of passions and only focus on one. But after a while, you'll start to feel phantom limb pain. I spent my teenage years obsessed with songwriting and playing in bands. But then I decided I needed to focus on just writing. So I spent half a decade hardly playing many, any music at all. The phantom limb got worse and worse. About a year ago, I started playing in a band again. Now I'm starting to feel whole. And the crazy thing is, rather than the music taking away from my writing, I find it interacting with my writing and making it better. I can tell that new synapses are firing in my brain and the connections are being made. Mm. Here's why I thought that was a very valuable passage. I'm kind of old school in this regard, but I still believe in the idea that you should follow your passion. Although I think the more fashionable route to go is to write blog posts and make TED talks about why it's dumb to follow your passion or why you should follow something else. And I actually think the idea of following your passion is indisputable. I think it's obviously true, uncontroversially true. The reason that I think it appears to be controversial 
is because people have taken that phrase and they have forced it to mean something that is completely unnecessary and that is unnecessarily complicated. And that is take your passion and figure out a way to monetize it. Okay, if that's what you mean by follow your passion, then yeah, you can't always do that because you're going to have interest in life that can't be monetized. All right, but what if it doesn't have to mean that? What if follow your passion just means what it says? What if it just means create space in your life to do the things that are interesting to you and fun to you, whether you make money or not? The idea that your passions are meaningless if you can't find a way to monetize them is based on the false assumption that your job should be the end all be all of your life and that it should be the only source of fun. No matter how awesome of a job you have, because you as a human being are bigger than the role you play for money, your job will never be able to satisfy all of your needs. You need friends, you need hobbies, you need other things to do outside of your job. So even if you work for the NBA and you love basketball, you're still going to have other things that you enjoy outside of basketball. Guess what? Basketball players love music and they aren't all in the music business. Basketball players love to write. Basketball players love to do a lot of things besides play basketball. So even if you have your dream job or you are pursuing your dream job, you have to create space in your life to play around with things that are fascinating to you for no other reason than that they are fun. Even if there's no argument that can be given that they're gonna make you better at your job. We've gotta do away with this idea that passions are meaningless if you can't make a career out of them. If you're 60 years old and you don't have time to make a career out of playing the violin, that doesn't mean it's a waste of time for you to learn how to play the violin. If that brings you joy, that makes you a better human being, period. I want to play devil's advocate and I'll provide some context and I'm going to ask you a follow-up question. Um, I think yeah. what this passage really uh, was outlining was the decision that a lot of creators have to make when they feel like they're multi-talented um, and, and th they're trying to decide how is their energy best spent? Do I need to pick a lane, stick with my lane and dominate my lane, or am I a jack of all trades? Um, and, and I know one of the books that both of us are big fans of, um, I mean, one of my, one of my favorite books I've read is, is mastery by Robert green. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, you know, there, there's, uh, other books, other works out there that, that just illustrate this point of, of being, you know, a master of this craft, being a specialist. Um, and, and, and I'd love to hear kind of your take on the Jack of all trades or, you know, picking your lane and staying, staying to it. Yeah, the jack of all trades thing is really interesting. I, I think in many ways, it's an illusion. Here's what I mean. Yes, there are people that are multifaceted. In fact, I think we all are, we just might overlook ways in which we are multifaceted, or we might look at certain areas and say, well, that doesn't count. That doesn't count. And so we arbitrarily define ourselves as being one dimensional. But I think we're all multifaceted. I think being a human being is to be a multidimensional creature. But one of the best ways to kind of get over yourself, if you think you are a jack of all trades, is to ask other people how they see you. Because inside your head, you have so mm. many interests. But when other people describe you, you just do one thing. Like for me, the majority of my books are not about motivation or self-help. Most motivation books bore me. My favorite books are about philosophy, economics, systems theory, information theory, personal knowledge management, religion, theology, all sorts of things. But whenever I talk, I show up on other people's radar as TK is a motivator. He's a motivator. I can give a full out lecture on philosophy and all people will hear is he's a motivator. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm drawing from science fiction. I'm drawing from Western analytic philosophy. I'm drawing from Eastern religion. I'm giving you a whole lot of different dimensions here. And people just hear one thing, TK is motivating me to live my best life. And what that reveals to you is that although you have many different sides to who you are, you are still one person and there is something that is unique and singular about the way you bring those things together in order to create value for other people. 
So I don't look at stay in your lane as being a message about pick one major or pick one topic. I look at stay in your lane as being about identify the way you like to bring things together. Because with all of your different interests, across all of them, there's some underlying why that makes all of those different things interesting to you. They might be different sports, different fields, different topics, different subjects, but there's a common thread that makes all of those things awesome to you. And you're the only one with that answer. And you've got to identify what that is and serve people. So if you're interested in golf and basketball and mathematics, you are the connecting point between those things. And you can have a way to bring those things together in, in, in a way that's exclusive to you. And it becomes a competitive advantage. Does that make sense? 1000%. And I, I think I, I recently went through this activity myself. I had heard it multiple times about asking other people, like, how do you see me? What do you think my 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 thing is? Um, because I 100% back what you said. I, I think I look at myself and I see all of these things um, that I'm pretty good at, you know, that 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 I uh, am better than most, uh, that I have a, a, a good working competency and, and, and that really contributes to my work and the way I do things and, and how versatile I can be. But every single person said the same thing. Like they said, when it comes to building relationships, when it comes to getting to know people, when it comes to being friends, like you, you do it so easily. I watch you do it. You're, you're, I mean, you're just such um, an extrovert, a, a socialite. I mean, you, you, you do it with grace and ease that most of us cannot do it do it with. And it's weird because I agree. I feel that I bring a lot of different things to that table. Um, but people do see you as one way. Um, and, and that's kind of your thing that that's what you shine the most at. And a lot of times we don't pay a lot of attention to that. We, we, we just kind of brush it off as, as something that, you know, it, it just kind of is what it is, but that that's what people know you as that's what they appreciate about you. That's, that's your unique quality. And so I agree that, if you have other things that you're interested in, you know, you should keep pursuing them. And I think that's the, what the second part of this passage went on to say is that when he was doing writing or when he was doing uh, just various different instrument scales, it all contributed to his overarching goal of songwriting. And I think when you pursue different aspects, different things that you're interested in, um, they do contribute to your one main thing that you're dominant in that. And, and it just makes you uh, multi-dimensional. It makes you uh, more interesting. You're, you're not very predictable. You're, you're pulling things uh, from different facets and, and, and different, you know, studies uh, and, and, and topics, and, and you're bringing something unique to, to the thing that you're good at. I, I remember, I got to paraphrase it. I, I read this Ernest Hemingway quote years ago. And he said something to the effect of there is no such thing as true omission. And he basically said, as a writer, everything that resonates with you is going to find a way to bleed through in your writing. So let's say you are writing a horror novel, all right? But you also have a strong interest in mathematics. There is going to be a mathematical quality to your thinking and to your writing, it may come through in you being logically rigorous and you being very precise and structured, but it's going to come through even though you're writing about horror, right? Uh, I think about Kobe who spent some time studying soccer players because he, he was just fascinated with their footwork. And that was a part of his game that bled through when he would play basketball. But you wouldn't know that about him unless you had a conversation with him or unless you were a big fan who studied his process. So part of part of kind of resolving the dilemma that comes from having so many different interests is you've got to trust yourself and you've got to trust your path to know that everything that you love and you devote time to is going to find a way to show up and express itself through the work that you do. You don't need to limit yourself to some job that is, is explicitly associated in the popular consciousness with your interest. So a lot of people get confused and they say, well, I really am interested in money, so I guess I got to be an accountant. 
You know, I, I really love to argue and debate, so I guess I should be a lawyer. And they force themselves into these boxes yeah. because of the yeah. popular associations with an existing job and the interest they have. But you actually have the power to bring your interests together in a manner that serves people in a, in a way that maybe no one has ever seen before or that no existing job corresponds to because you got to be yeah. the one to create that. Yeah, definitely. let's go to insight three, man. Yeah. Work while you wonder, practice while you philosophize, create while you contemplate. If I had waited to know who I was or what I was about before I started being creative, well, mm. I'd still be sitting around trying to figure out myself instead of making things. In my experience, it's in the act of making things and doing work that we figure out who we are. Mm. I mean, he says it best. I think we often try to use philosophy and analysis as a way of protecting ourselves from reality. Because we're afraid of reality, we do a whole lot of thinking and we say, well, let me figure mm. out exactly who I am, what I want, what my complete belief system is, what all the right decisions are. And it's a way of trying to insulate ourselves from risk so we can go out there and experience reality as a friendly, supportive, affirming thing. And it's actually the other way around. The way you discover what you really believe and who you really are and what you really want is by engaging reality and using the unique kind of feedback that reality provides to shape your understanding of life. Because there are things you can only know through experience that just aren't available to you through contemplation. I mean, what kind of ice cream do you like? Or do you like it at all? You can't know that through philosophy. You got to actually go out there and taste the ice cream. That's when you find out what you're made of. You find out that you're a person that's allergic to it, or you're a person that only likes chocolate, or you're a person that doesn't like it, whatever it may be. And there are so many things that are like that in life. And one of the ways we can give ourselves permission to be more like this is by letting go of this idea that we are wasting our time when we try things for a short period of time. This goes back to that earlier point we discussed. We're so pragmatic in our thinking. We feel so much pressure, pressure to justify everything we do that we don't give ourselves permission to try being in the choir for a month, try taking an improv class for a month, just try doing anything for a month and knowing that if you don't like it and never do it again, that's not a waste of time because one, you have a cool story to tell. Number two, you met some interesting people. Number three, you open yourself up to a new way of looking at the world. And number four, you found out some stuff that you don't like, and that's useful. Uh, I, I'd like you to, uh, to, to, to tell people for who, who may not be familiar that uh, what you did with American Idol and uh, why, why you approached that experience the way you did. Yeah, man. Oh, gosh, it might take a whole episode to tell that that full story. But <laughs> once upon a time, I auditioned for American Idol once upon a time. And one of my friends, Paige Kennedy, I, I actually wrote a chapter about this in a book called Why Haven't You Read This Book? So I tell the whole story. My chapter is called Why Haven't You Auditioned for American Idol? And you can actually find the uh, the audio version read by Mitchell Earl. You can find it online as well. We can share the links. But Long story short, my homeboy Paige Kennedy just kept pushing me to audition for it, kept pushing me to audition for it. And I won't front. I mean, I, I love singing. I love doing it to this day. I'm not pursuing a career in it. But I went out there and auditioned, and it was like, hey, what is there to lose? And I went out there and completely failed, completely. <laughs> like, didn't even come close, bro. <laughs> didn't even come close. But... A couple of things from that. Number one, whenever I talk to young people, that's the first thing they want to know about. They, they, they don't want to hear about the job I worked at for five years where I showed up on time every day. They want to hear that story, man. They want to hear about the failures. That's what makes me interesting to them. The second thing is because I actually went out there and did that, I discovered one of the most valuable things you can discover in life, which is, hey, these things I'm afraid of, 
they're not as bad as they look in the imagination. Nobody really cares. I mean, maybe some people laugh about it for fun, but it hasn't hurt me. It hasn't hurt me. There is nothing that I'm trying to get in life that people deny me like, hey, wait a minute. You're the brother that uh, didn't make American Idol. I'm not going to give you this job. I'm not going to I'm not going to work with you. I'm not going to hang out with you. Nobody ever does that. But the person that I got to become as a result of trying that, man, it's so immensely valuable. And it truly does inform everything else that I do. It's not just a thing that I did that didn't work out. It's a thing that I did that made me more valuable and gave me a different perspective on the stuff that is working out today. Without that failure, I don't know if I would be experiencing today's successes in the same way. Mm, mm. Yeah, I, I think for me, this this specific lesson manifests in a couple of different ways. Um, I, I think I can speak on both sides of the equation, on the sides of um, still being paralyzed by um, prag pragmatic approaches and, and logic and wanting to plan everything down to the T. Um, and then I can also uh, speak to the side of just kind of going for it and and doing my version of an American Idol audition. And I think, mm. you know, from 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 the from the on the front side of it, um, you know, talking about just the planning and the logicalness and and wanting to have a sound experience before doing the experience. I think for one, especially coming up as a child of the internet, um, the older I've gotten, the more that you've kind of seen a uh, public humiliation just go to an entirely different level. And I think that really terrifies people. Nobody wants to be the mm. butt of a viral tweet that, you know, everybody knows um, I think nobody wants to be, you know, the next, uh, what was the, the gorilla, the gorilla group, glue girl who, uh, put gorilla glue in her hair. And, and, I mean, she was viral for, for weeks and weeks and weeks, um, because of this mistake. Maybe it wasn't a mistake that she made and nobody, nobody wants to be that. I think people are terrified of that, but I would also say that, you know, in terms of the, you know, the, the vast amount of things that get put on the internet, that is a very, very small percentage of, of instances that people blow up uh, for looking a certain way. I, I'm not sure what the statistic is, but there are hundreds, maybe even thousands of videos uploaded on YouTube every single day. People don't care. People, people are not paying attention to your every single move. And I think it's so much scarier to try things, to experiment, to put yourself out there, to to, to work on uh, yourself publicly, you know, to share your ideas. It's so much scarier on the front end because, you know, once you put it out, you, you know, you're not sure what, what's going to happen to it. But I think you can reassure yourself because everybody's putting out thousands of things on the internet a day, a day. And, and, and it's a freeing feeling once you get, um, and once you put something out, I think, you know, from a personal experience, life and experiences are the best teacher for me. You know, live in life in the moment. Yeah. You, I can philosophize, I can plan all I want, but you know, the old saying goes is that, you know, we make plans and then God laughs. The, you can make plans all you want, but you can't account for the things that you're gonna learn on the fly. You can't account for the circumstances that are gonna change. Um, and, and, and that works on the negative and the positive. I think most people are just paralyzed by the fear of what if this doesn't go to plan and what if this doesn't go to plan. But a lot of times there's blessings. There, there's things that happen that you couldn't have accounted for that that have changed the entire game, like that, that have made your experiment or experience just that much better because you were willing to put it out um, and to do that. And so you know, having been on both sides of it, you know, having went for some stuff and, and got more public and then, and, you know, being in the stage where I'm still battling that, that creative fear of, of being too public, you know, I, I can say all of the times that I've just went with it, I've never regretted it. And, and, and I, you know, we're often our, our worst critic. I mean, everybody else who sees the content um, is never like, oh, you know, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, like those are things that are in my head. Most people either they'll say something nice about it or they don't care at all and they'll just move on. And I think 
knowing that you're going to be your worst critic um, and, and just knowing that most people really just don't care. So you might as well just do it for your own experience. You might as well just do it for your own learnings. You might as well just do it to improve your own confidence because um, the more you do, the easier it gets. But if you're paralyzed by fear, just know that you know, you're probably making, you're definitely making a bigger deal out of it that most people don't really care. Just so just do it. Yeah, man, there's always somebody with a fake name and a fake profile pic talking smack about somebody in the comments. The worst thing you can do is let those people determine your destiny in life. Don't hide from your destiny in the way that those people hide from owning their opinions. Don't hide from your destiny in the way that those people hide in the comment section. Don't hide from your destiny in the way that those people hide behind a false sense of superiority because they're not willing to be the ones to put themselves out there and take the heat from commenters who use fake names and fake profile pics. And by the way, I'm not condemning the use of fake names and fake profile pics. I have no problem with it. My point is don't let those people determine your destiny. If you got something that you want to do in life, the absolutely worst thing that you can possibly do is to deny your convictions, to refuse what makes you come alive because you're afraid <laughs> that somebody with a fake name and a fake profile pic is going to get on there and become a keyboard warrior and say, this is stupid. This is stupid. I have an exercise that I do. I truly do this and I do it periodically. I even wrote a blog post about it. Every once in a while, usually it's like every few months, I'll Google some person or project that I have respect for. And I use a different name every time. And I see how long it takes me to find a comment where somebody's talking smack about it. Never takes me more than two minutes. Give me any movie. Give me any celebrity. Give me any author. Give me any influencer. Give me any historical figure. And it has never taken me longer than two minutes to find a comment where somebody's talking smack about that person, saying that they're overrated, saying that we're admiring the wrong person, saying that they're not really talented or whatever it may be. And I do that as a practice to remind myself of something very important, which is if all the people and projects that you respect and admire are having this done to them, don't think for a second that you're gonna be the first guy in history to escape that wrath. It will come up on you. There is nothing that you can do to stop people from talking smack about you. Even if you succeed, by the way, <laughs> don't get it twisted and think, oh, I don't wanna fail because that'll go viral and people will talk smack about me. Okay, what if you succeed? The same thing is still gonna happen. In fact, when you succeed, there's always a group of people that's looking at your success and because they define it differently, they're gonna be like, man, what happened to him? What happened to her? What happened to them? When did they go off the deep end? Everybody's definition of success ain't going to be the same as yours. People are going to talk smack about you anyway. Don't hold yourself back from doing things that are interesting to you because of that. And by the way, I don't speak from somebody that has to theorize about this. I know exactly what it's like for people to talk smack about me in the comments. I went on, are you smarter than a fifth grader and got the first question wrong. And I had the video circulating with just that portion where I got the first question wrong and people was hating like mad, hasn't affected a single dollar I've earned, hasn't affected a single friend I have, hasn't affected my marriage, hasn't affected anything. Nobody really cares, man. That stuff is so exaggerated. So what's that girl's name? Is it the Gorilla Glue Girl? Is that what you said? I'm not familiar with this. So Gorilla Glue Girl, if you're listening right now, <laughs> let me tell you how this really works, okay? You can let this viral moment destroy you. And I don't mean to make light of it. You might be going through a hard time right now. Stay encouraged because down the road, you do something interesting with your life and that part is up to you. This is going to be the thing that makes people want to talk to you more than anybody else in your field. If you decide that you want to go be a medical doctor, everybody's going to be like, wait, you were the the gorilla glue girl back in the day and now you're a doctor everybody's gonna want you on your pot on their podcast they're gonna want you on their show and it's gonna be a whole bunch of other doctors in your field who think they're smarter than you who got better grades than you and they're gonna be mad they're gonna be jealous because everybody wants to talk to the gorilla glue girl who went on to become a doctor <laughs> whatever good you have going on in your life it's this moment 
that's going to make people be interested in you. And look, when you're 30, when you're 40, nobody's going to care because everybody understands what it's like to be young and to have a viral moment or just have a moment where you end up looking bad. The only people that do care will be the people hiding behind the fake names and the fake profile pics. And if they had any real power, they wouldn't be hiding like that. So you yeah, gotta I love worry that. about that. I mean, for sure. I mean, it's, I mean, the message in a core just sounds like go for it. If you mess up, it'll make you a more interesting person. There you go. There you go. Let's go to insight number four, man. We could go, we could go on all day, bro. Read like your sense of creativity depends on it. Yeah, this, this one really resonated with me. Always be reading. Go to the library. There's magic in being surrounded by books. Get lost in the stacks. Read bibliographies. It's not, it's not in the book you start with. It's the book that leads you. Or I'm sorry. It's not in the book you start with. It's the book that the book leads you to. Interesting. Mm. Yeah, l- I, I believe I'd like, to, I'd like to hear yeah. you. I'd like to hear you kick this one off is because I think well, I mean, we could just see every 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 live stream you were in the stacks, you got stacks and stacks of book and it, it's one of the things that uh, you have the most pride and in, in fulfillment your book collection and, and I, the last line was really interesting. It's not in the book that you start with, but it's the book that leads you to the other books. Um, so I, I'd like to just, how did, what is your whole process for, for, for reading? Man, I'm trying to find this post that um, I wrote on Facebook that I think would be so apropos to what we're talking about right now. Um, give me a minute here. You're good. You're good. But I, yeah. I, 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 I'll, I'll go ahead and riff while you're looking for that. Um, what yeah. I would say is that, man, reading, I think <laughs> it, 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 it really informs you uh, not only on a literal level, but I think it, it, inf- it changes the way you think. It changes the things that you bring to the table. It changes your approach. It makes uh, your creativity uh, multidimensional. Uh, you're, I mean, you're pulling in ideas from, from, you know, this genre to that genre. Uh, and, and a lot of times you're making a new genre. Like TK is as unique as he is, is because his interests are so wide and so broad. Um, but at the same time, they're also very niched. And it's just an interesting uh, combination of niche interest that manifests in this, you know, these, uh, what do they call them? Uh, stream of consciousness, stream of consciousness, uh, mm. you know, that we've never heard before. They're, they're just a stream of consciousness of all these ideas from all these genres. Uh, and, and it makes it seem like it's just something we've never heard before. But in, in, in the book, one of the things he talks about is how everything is a remix. Everything is just um, no new ideas are really brought to the table. You're I think the people who are the, the 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 generation of innovators and the people who who are kind of elevating themselves and maybe uh, the fields that that they work within is the people that are that are cross pollinating that are bringing things from all all uh, ends of the spectrum and and they're making something uh, seem unique because they they're putting things in a different perspective that most people aren't accustomed to. Yeah. You know, I think most of us learn how to read in a way that's completely backwards when it comes to cultivating a genuine love for books. When we learn how to read, think about how you receive your assignments when you're in school. Some teacher says, here's the book that we're going to read, and there's going to be a test on it later. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, you just took away the most important part of the assignment, which is picking the book, right? Like, Once somebody else picks the book, they've already decided the agenda. They've already decided what's important. And I guess now you try to figure out what the plot was, or you try to anticipate what sorts of questions you will be asked on the test. And, you know, I guess that has its place, but that's not how life works in the real world. When you go out into the real world, there's no one with the power to make you show up and read a book every week. So how do you decide how to pick a book? You've got to start with the questions that keep you awake at night. 
You've got to start with the things that make your heart sing. You've got to start with your taste and your interest. You've got to start with the things that you want to be good at with your own priorities. And most of us never get around to learning that. So we associate reading with the memorization of information rather than with the transformation of consciousness. But that's really what it should be about. It shouldn't be about memorizing information. It should be about becoming a different person through the shaping mm. of your own mind. You know, and, and it's not even about a literal textbook. You can do this with audiobooks. You can do this with podcasts. You can do this now with a lot of different sources of information. But it's about realizing that there are so many different ways of thinking. And you can improve your own way of thinking by interacting with the ideas of other people who lived in different time periods, who have so many different experiences from you. Books are like a portal, man, that, that allows us to travel places that are physically impossible for us to go. And so I, I truly do believe that if you're serious about creating the results that matter most to you, you got to make a commitment to engage ideas that don't come from your own mind. It's very valuable to meditate. It's very valuable to generate your own ideas, but it is also valuable to get outside of your own head and interact with thoughts that don't emanate from a mind that is like yours, that has a similar rhythm and style to your own thinking. Yeah, I, I would also say for, and this might not be interesting to everybody or um, desired by everybody, but if wisdom is something that you appreciate, if it's something that uh, you like to embody, if, it, if it's an approach to thinking, uh, if it's an approach uh, to problem solving, if it's an approach to giving advice that, that you like to explore, if you like to be the wise one, if you like to interact with other people or who are wise, if you enjoy uh, talking and, and getting advice from wise counsel, then I think reading really accelerates I, I, I don't think there's actually another form, another medium out there that can offer you as much wisdom and 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 give you and like allow you to embody that wisdom yourself and and and, and make you more wise um, than reading. I think reading is the best medium uh, for wisdom, and and it. I think wisdom is one of those things that you can't. You can't really be taught that in school. You can't read a textbook and learn how to be wise. I think a lot of times wisdom comes from experience. It comes from uh, trying something and then that doesn't work or trying something and it does work. Um, or it can come secondhand from, from a story, from somebody else's. And I think I think the, the kinds of stories that you interact with, the kinds of experiences that you interact with, books just offer so much of that. Like that's the point yeah. of it. Um, so I, yeah. I've found that when I was in 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 times times of my life where I read a lot, uh, I, I just felt so much more uh, poised and 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 confident about the way that I was approaching. Uh, I'll just say life, j just broadly speaking. Like I, I felt very grounded um, and 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 wise. That you know I had maybe peers around me who didn't understand why I was making the moves that I was making, and mm. you know I. Th Times before that, I, I might have sought sought their approval. I might have been like, "Hey, you know, I would appreciate you guys if you backed me on this idea um, that I feel pretty good about." But you know, I'm just kind of looking for some confirmation. When I was in times that I read a lot, I I, I didn't need that. I didn't even care about that. Um, I I yeah. knew I knew how how in line I was I, I was in with like this eternal wisdom um, that predated me, but I was using to inform my decision. So. I think that's just a really cool uh, part to reading that maybe certain people don't think about. It might not even be appealing to everybody, but wisdom mm -hmm. to me is, is one of the things that uh, I think I pride myself on, on trying to make those kind of decisions and, and has usually put me far ahead of the people uh, who, you know, you could consider peers or, you know, uh, competition, whatever, you know, but it, it's, it's kind of that extra thing that a lot of people just take for advantage. I think you're exactly right. I, I think a good way to think about the way books affect us is imagine that your consciousness is like a fire and imagine that books are pieces of wood. And every time you throw a piece of wood, the fire consumes it and it gets bigger and it gets stronger. It adds life to it. 
And there's something about the interaction of the fire and the wood that makes this happen. That interaction is essential. And so when you when you read books, it's not it's not so much about being able to say, I read it. Hey, man, I, I, I did the book a week challenge because it's possible to read at a very shallow level. It's about seeing how those thoughts land. Um, I believe it was Kafka who said to read the books that disturb you, re read the books that like put the ax to the ice in your soul. When you're reading, mm -hmm. you want to read things that make you mad. And then you can look inward and say, whoa, what's that about? Why did I get so mad when that person said that? What, what bothers me? That's where the wisdom comes from. That's where the learning comes from. It's not about being able to quote somebody. It's about being disturbed by what that author said and it forcing you to examine your own heart in a way that nothing else made you do. Read the books that make you angry. Read the books that make you feel a little fear. Read the books that make you feel a little uncertainty. Read the books that take that sense of security and safety that you have and poke and prod at it and say, whoa, I don't know if I like this. I find myself breathing hard. That's the kind of stuff that's going to change you. Mortimer Adler said, it's not how many books you get through. It's how many books get through to you. Read the books that poke and prod at your soul. And that's when you'll set the foundation for, for wisdom because they'll drive you into rich interior exploration. We got one more to do. Let's, 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 let's hit it up. Number five. Stop chasing after originality. Nothing is original. The writer Jonathan Lethem has said that when people call something original, nine times out of 10, they just don't know the references or the original sources involved. What a good artist understands is that nothing comes from nowhere. All creative work builds on what came before. Every new idea is just a matchup or a remix of one or more previous ideas. I think the key insight for me here was, why do we care about being original anyway? The reason we care is because none of us want to be perceived as a copycat. That, that rubs us the wrong way. If Kamal tells a joke and then I memorize his, his joke and then I tell it, that's why comedians look down on people who steal other people's jokes, right? None of us wanna be a ripoff artist. None of us wanna be a copycat. Well, the solution to that isn't so much about being obsessed with originality. The solution to that is to focus on being authentic, to be genuine, because there are moments where we pick up things from other people and it's not only acceptable, but it's admirable. And what, what, what defines those moments? What defines those moments is when we take something from other people and we internalize it in such a way that people can tell when we say it, we're not giving a memorized definition or whatever it may be. It, it, it's sort of like when someone says, hey, tell me what that means in your own words. Th they're still allowing you to do what it is you're doing, but, but they just want to hear you say it in a way that exhibits understanding, that you actually own it, that you know it for yourself. And I think that's the key to being creative. It's, it's not trying to use words that have never been used before. It's not trying to use elements that no one else has used before. It's making sure that the elements you use and the words that you use, they have been so heavily internalized that you own them. And when you create, you create from an authentic expression of what truly lives and breathes and moves about on the, on the inside of your soul. And so I think that's what it's all about, man. Like everything truly is a remix. There's nothing new under the sun, but that's okay because there's never been a you before and there's enough originality in how you bring things together. Mm. Yeah, you know, I think the direction uh, I, I'd like to go in it is if you idolize one person, you know, we'll say uh, Kobe Bryant and, and the way that he idolized Michael Jordan. And if you study that person and you, you imitate all their stuff and, um, you know, you, you model your game the exact same way, people are going to call you a hack. Even if if even if you try to put a little flair here or you put, try to put a little flair there, yeah. people will call you a hack because they will be able to recognize it. Now, if you're in that same position and you look at Michael Jordan, you and you you pull influence from him. You look at Magic Johnson and you pull influence from him. You look at Scottie Pippen. You look at you know uh, 
Wilt Chamberlain, you, you look at Dr. J, and, and you're just pulling various aspects of all of these different people's game. You know, if you go from one influence to 10, to 20, to 30, to 100 different people, people will not call you a hack. People will call you an original genius because you are taking various components of all of these people's game and you're you're blending it together. And so I think people, you know, who, who may have fear around, um, you know, being called a hack or, or, or feeling bad about, um, you know, mimicking and, and copying people. I, I wouldn't say stop doing that. I would just, just say uh, broaden the the people that you're pulling from, broaden uh, the list of, of names that you're copying from, because I think interacting with all of their different works is you're not going to be able to help but change your game. You're not mm-hmm. going to be able to help but broaden, um, you know, the, the kinds of work that you produce. All of that stuff is going to, um, influence you and it's going to interact differently together. And I think that's where you really get the mashup and the remix aspect. But if you're, if you're just pulling off of one person, you know, people, people are going to be able to recognize that. But if you're pulling off of a hundred, nobody's going to be able to see anything. Yeah. It's kind of like the, the letters of the alphabet. You and I are using all the same letters when we talk, but how we string them together, how we form our sentences that's a, an expression of our unique personalities. Two musicians can sit down and play the piano and neither one of them is using an original note. They're using all the same notes that all the other musicians have used, but it's the way they bring them together. And so I would sum it up by saying, don't be afraid of being unoriginal. Be afraid of being one dimensional. Be afraid of being someone who isn't true to the full gamut of their interest. If you're starting out in something, and you're just copying one person, and that's your way of mastering it, that's your way of getting familiar with the fundamentals, that's fine. But like Kamal said, be true to the other interests that you have. And over time, as you're true to all your different interests, those things are going to bleed through you in a way that's unique to you. And people will say, wow, you're so original. But you'll know that you're just a combination of that, 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 and so many sources that it's impossible to trace it to a single origin because you're the only one on earth that will bring all of those things together in, in that particular way. Kamal, that's how you the still, ball to you, that's man. That's how you still a final shot. I mean, that's how you still like an artist. <laughs> that's it. You know, I, I, I think it, 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 it might sound worse than it is. Um, but the way that you still like an artist is remixing the hell out of things. Um, it's, yeah. it's, it's taken influence from everywhere and, and making something that hasn't been seen before. And it is okay to steal. It is okay to derive, uh, your work, your creative work from other people. I think it's important to also, it's, I mean, not important. I mean, it is one of the fundamental principles that you, you pay the work forward. Uh, you know, you pay the creativity forward, uh, you give credit where credit is due, but if you're remixing something, I mean, that that is an original work. Your remix is an original work. So um, lean into that. You know, draw, broaden your scope, uh, and and then steal like an artist. Hey, that's it. If you enjoyed this episode, you know what to do. Hit the like, hit the subscribe, leave us a comment telling us what you thought. Hey, even if that thought is as simple as great episode, guys. Enjoy the episode. Whatever it may be, leave a comment for us. And don't forget to share the episode with the family or friend, share it on your social media, help us get the word out because we're trying to teach people how to achieve freedom from the inside out. You support that, share this with the world. All right, everybody, tune in next time. We'll see you next week on Wednesday. Peace.